Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Ben, founder of The Neighborhood. And I totally did not realize the cutoff for submitting slides, so we're going to freestyle the visuals here a little bit. Um, just ignore the breadcrumbs. They're going to be all wrong. Uh, OK, so The Neighborhood is a one square mile campus in the middle of San Francisco. And we help start autonomous communities and hangout spots. Uh, we are grant funded for the next two years. Uh, we that gives me time to build up uh, sustainable uh, partnerships with real estate providers, uh, and that'll be our business model. Um, as for this kicked off a movement piece, um, I basically just drew a circle on a map, and 20,000 people saw it. And it turns out when you spend an absurd amount of effort justifying why one square mile in the Bay Area is the best in the whole Bay Area, and people are already willing to live in the rough vicinity, they are totally down to move there. Uh, and so it does feel like a little movement. Um, We've also inspired uh, at least 150 people to move. I have kind of lost count. Uh, we've also inspired communities like HF0, uh, which is an AI accelerator, and Solaris and Matt's at Makerspace to start here. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, OK, so mainly what I spend all my time doing is trying to create truly excellent co-living communities. Uh, that is the foundation of the neighborhood. Co-living is where 10 to 20 adults usually live in one big house and share a kitchen. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar, you might be skeptical. It's, it's like kind of a niche subculture, and it's like really popular in San Francisco, but not as much elsewhere. I was certainly skeptical, too. Uh, but for background, my first co-living experience started in 2016 when I co-founded a house called The Archive here. Uh, in the beginning, we were an ambitious but not obviously unusual group of friends. And over the next six years, the 15 founding teams in the house co-founded companies that have now raised $1.1 billion dollars and co-authored GPT-3, which none of us would have ever predicted. Amazingly, a third of those teams said that the archive was pivotal to their outcomes. Look at this, a bunch of normal hippies. I mean, this is like very regular. And uh, those are amazing outcomes. So the natural question is, why don't more houses like this exist? Like, there was 20x more demand for the archive than there was space. So why are these transformative co-living communities so rare? Well, the main problem is that you need some really great people. Like, some of my housemates were just amazing. Uh, but great people are really hard to coordinate. So if they're charismatic, they have rich social lives. If they're really interesting, they spend their weekends building tentacle robots or hacking Afghanistan, which are both real stories. Uh, and so how do you start many new ones? I, uh, it's hard to say. So one key insight came from the unconferences I've been going to. Uh, an unconference is like a conference like this, except it's much smaller. And everyone gives an informal talk about anything they want. And I kept noticing that these events, these weekends, kept producing really strong senses of community. And there's a bunch of reasons for this. But the main one is that when everyone has a chance to demonstrate their passion, uh, you're often bursting with conversations by the end of the weekend, and you feel like you're part of a special group. Uh, but unfortunately, they always scatter to the winds after. And so this is one of the key insights. Perhaps an unconference could be a kind of archive factory, and this could be the keystone of the neighborhood strategy. So I set to work, and I hosted my first unconference in March of this year. Yeah, here's the right slide. Uh, and it was themed around climate. So recruiting a great group is the central challenge of this whole project, and so it's how I spend most of my time. Uh, unfortunately, in January, I had all of five friends in climate. Right, I'm on time. Uh, so I told one of those five friends about the concept, and she got really excited, and she pulled out her phone on the spot, and she went through three months of texts, and she recommended 25, different, uh, of her favorite, uh, 25 of her favorite people in climate right on the spot. And that was when I realized that I could curate this whole event through chains of warm introductions, uh, which was great. Uh, so I wanted the bar for a warm recommendation to be, I want to be more like this person in some way, but I also wanted an even gender ratio, and I wanted everyone to be at least curious about co-living in the Bay Area. And while I'm at it, I also wanted there to be representation from all the different skill sets that are relevant to climate. And I wanted it to be mostly builders and at most 15% VCs. Uh, and those are a lot of constraints for someone who's outside of the industry. So I built a tool to help. Uh, I made a live updating dashboard that predicts the expected number of attendees for each category given our funnel metrics and conversion ratios between funnels. And I scraped people's LinkedIn's, and I wrote, I used GPT to predict which categories everyone was in. And then I would send people this document, this live updating dashboard, before asking for their recommendations. 
and they would see that our goal for non-male attendees was 40%, but we're only currently at 33%, or that we're looking for all these types of uh, technical skill sets, but we don't have any industrial engineers or oceanographers yet. And lo and behold, when they see this document first, 75% of their warm introductions would be for the categories we were missing. And so recommendations became self-correcting. And so over a period of two months, I went from six friends in climate to collecting 300 warm introductions. Uh, my EA and I researched 206. We invited 152. 92 expressed interest in attending. 61 ultimately attended. And we hit basically all of our constraints almost exactly, which was amazing. Uh, we aimed for 40% non-male and hit 37.7%, which is not bad for a deep tech conference. We wanted at most 15% funders and got 13.9%. We, want, we wanted 19 skill sets and got 18, et cetera. And despite not explicitly seeking them, 54% of the people that came were our venture-backed founders, which was interesting. And it produced critical mass for our co-living house. It, it, it seeded a, a medium-sized group that started meeting with me every week to recruit, find a house, and build the culture that we wanted to uh, eventually start. My sister even came and got a job. It was awesome. Uh, by the way, event planning is a chaotic business. My original venue was covered by six feet of snow 10 days before the event. And so I had to replan the whole thing. So we had to, uh, I, I hit the original dates, but we had new chefs, new venues, and staff. Uh, however, the new venue neglected to tell me that their decor was like the party store vomited on Barbie's dream house. <laughs> it was for a singles party for the owner's 60-something mom, like the next night. And so we changed the theme from climate to I love climate. <laughs> we made a few tactical updates to the decor. Sweet earth. <laughs> no. Always be mitigating your carbon impact. It worked out great. So it produced the chumminess that we were hoping for. Um, but 61 people is slightly too small. And if you want to create a 15-person co-living house in one fell swoop, you need to double or triple the size of the event. But that creates a new problem which is at big conferences, and maybe we can relate to this here, uh, make it really hard to connect with people, which is why we're all here. So they're mostly big group conversations, and it's difficult to justify a one-on-one -on -one conversation when you're always being interrupted uh, in a chaotic environment. And so for my next conference, which was three months later and themed around AI and alignment, I tried something different. Um, the basic idea was to break up everyone at the conference into groups of four for every breakfast, lunch, and dinner throughout the weekend and then I would dispatch them to local cafes and restaurants within walking distance, and now they have 90 minutes of quiet time, uninterrupted, to connect with three other people in their group, and there'd be different groups all weekend. Now, I could have matched people randomly, and it probably would have been an improvement, but I really wanted to find a way to make people, to introduce people to others that they really wanted to meet, um, and so being a former ML engineer for you know, nine years, naturally I used AI. So I asked everyone two questions, uh, during onboarding, I asked, what three questions would you love to talk about at this event? And summarize your technical background and expertise in a tweet. And then I asked GPT for every pair of people, would these two people have a great conversation based on any of person A's questions based on person B's expertise? And that produced a total preferences matrix, which I could feed to the state-of-the-art matching algorithm, which is called, it, the problem is called the stable roommates problem. The, the solution won a Nobel in 2012. And it outputs, given a preferences matrix for a group, uh, arbitrary subgroups of an arbitrary size. And so now I've got my groups of four, great, uh, and people really loved it. Uh, I know this from my qualitative feedback, but also because uh, a research scientist leading a team at DeepMind came up to me afterwards with tears in his eyes and said it would be hard to improve. And so now I've got the beginnings of a repeatable machine that creates communities that are both very well curated and very densely connected. So, the uh, March Climate Unconference did produce the nucleus of a co-living house, and after meeting them with them weekly for almost five months, we finally found a house and recruited the whole group, and they signed leases in September last month. They're called Treehouse, and I'm super proud of them. I think they're at least as warm and inspiring as the archive was when we started. And I can't wait to do the same for AI, for biotech, for sci-fi storytelling, for abundance policy, for meta-science, for neurotech, and for much more over the coming years. The Vibe's goal is to feel as cozy as a small town, as lively as a university campus, and uh, maybe the wild dream is to maybe have a little chance of kicking off a tiny renaissance in the middle of San Francisco. So if any of these tickle your fancy, uh, I invite you to connect with the neighborhood of this URL, 
And if you're curious about investing in a neighborhood real estate fund, then you can shoot me an email, organizers at neighborhoodsf.com. And thank you so much. <laughs>